namaste marco welcome to ahimsa conversations namaste so, thank you <laughs> so good to see you again as so, well uh marco what is your earliest memory from childhood of either the experience or the concept of ahimsa mm well i can't really recall i, I had a very ordinary finnish childhood but then at some point at youth i was um i was getting to getting exposed to this kind of non-violent uh, non-violence and critique of of militarism and actually it was in the boy scouts there was a group leader who was anti-militarist and anarchist uh, so i think from him i i i sort of Uh, learned and adapted this attitude that yes peace is better than war and and non-violence is better than violence and then then it sort of has pursued have pursued those ideas ever since are these common uh, uh, perceptions i mean is this a common mindset in in finnish activism or were you Uh, unusual were you in a minority within the finnish activist world when you began to incline towards nonviolence well in 80s in europe there was quite active peace movement um, actually i mean we had in all over europe there were big demonstrations i was a bit young to join them at at the peak but i remember marching in the united nations day i think for disarmament and especially nuclear disarmament so in that way the peace movement um but it was not hegemonic but it was uh, really important and so it was in the both the official speeches then during the cold war finland tried to play the play play uh, mid- middleman or at least be neutral um in between the 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 east and west block so so that that kind of things were there but still finland um has quite quite heavy militarist history writing that our independence came i mean after independence there was a civil war in 1918 and then in the second world war there was a, a big uh, fight with um, with soviet union and then towards the end also with with germany so so a lot of this you know heroism of military uh, fights is is there in the in the mainstream culture was there a compulsory military service when you were in your uh, when you were young yes so so finland was an is is among the highest conscripting uh, countries in Europe and uh, so i think at my youth about 90% of, of of young men went to the military service but then like i said through these influences i chose the alternative service the civilian service um which upset my my parents quite a bit and and but that was not all that then towards um end of my my service i i quit it because um well then we had a good debate about this whole conscription system and militarist uh, sort of upbringing that it it uh, involves so i quit five months prematurely and then i was put into into jail for two and a half months so i became sort of peace peace activists and uh, satyagrahi <laughs> in in a way uh, when i was about 20 Okay. About when would it be that you first became familiar with the term satyagraha and ahimsa and Gandhi? About when would that have been and how? Mm. Well, I think well of course Gandhi I would have known but maybe personalities like Martin Luther King were more more visible in our sort of imag- imagery. um but then when i went to serve this two and a half month sentence in a i mean not a not a very strict prison in a sort of op- open one and then thomas valgren my activist philosopher friend gave me gun his hint swaraj as a accompanying reader <laughs> to prison so and then i then i then got got sort of to the source 
uh, of of this uh, Gandhian Satyagraha and Ahimsa. Beautiful. Maybe this is a good time, uh, Markov, to bring in the story of how Hinswaraj came to be translated into Finnish and how that was done. If you, mm, if you could share yes. that story, please. Yes. Um, so we, for a number of years, discussed with this uh, this sort of group that had had established this Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam uh, network. That that would be important thing to do to have a Finnish translation of Hin Swaraj and then we went sort of normal route seeking grants and looking for professional translators and that didn't work out and then some friends in Sweden said that we should organize something for the salt march 75 anniversary 75 years anniversary and then we got this idea that well let's make this uh, crowd sourcing that, that name was not there but let's invite uh, people to come and translate one page each and and we did it and and very very soon we got more than 100 uh, volunteers um, and to everybody's surprise, the text was really good quality, that there was not so much editing in the end, that people really, uh, you know, applied their mind and did their best. Um, so, so that's how it was uh, done. And then the friendly publisher published it very, very soon. So it was uh, this kind of campaign mode. And and it's now it's nice we have 100 people in Finland who can say that I have translated Gandhi. <laughs> yes, I, I remember our friend, common friend, Auti, complaining yeah. to me that she only got the content page. Oh, okay, <laughs> maybe, she, maybe she was yeah. slow or maybe she was in the core team. So we gave yeah. chance yeah. to the, to the, to the yeah. eager ones first. Uh, Marco, I think you, you, I would request you to explain what Vasudev Kutumbakam Network is and how it came into existence. And... What is the role of nonviolence in this uh, gathering? Yes. It's really a more of a community. Uh, yes. But can you please spell out uh, how it came about mm. and what it represents to you? Yes. Well, it goes back to to eighties when when some from from our activist uh, circles people visited India and came in contact with Lokajan. Um, and, and CSDS and, and, and connected with that kind of uh, modernization, critical Gandhian socialist uh, thinking and politics. And, and then some you know, close friendships developed and then this kind of North-South democratic uh, collaboration. And I think for, for these friends in India, somehow they like the Finnish style. Of the, you know, we don't have, have imperial past like Swedes or British or so maybe in our sort of outlook, this um, this kind of really working together, doing to, doing things on on equal footing is uh, comes very naturally. So we had some visits back and forth. I think in '89 already there was Vijay Pratap visited. Um, Finland for one seminar where this kind of north-south solidarity discussion uh, took place and 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 the term Vasudhavakutumbakam the whole world is one family uh, was floated but then more intense collaboration started in early 2000 when the social forum uh, you know brought people together to work work more together this is the world social forum yes yeah, so so then for the hyderabad forum uh, we started a collaboration with this uh, title of south asian dialogues on ecological democracy and and then alongside uh, these friends friends in delhi had develop, developed this kind of comprehensive democracy approach as a response to the what was called satanic globalization that we that the democracy is the best antidote to to globalization and the problems uh, related to it but then it has to be deep and comprehensive so all aspects of life politics culture economy social justice and so on and so that was would have a kutumbagam framework then translated into comprehensive democracy or some purna swaraj um, 
sort of intervention and and that's under a banner with which we have done lots of things especially in the in the social forum context uh, do you ever get challenged for using the term vasudev kutumbakam in the sense that in india and actually anywhere in the world there are voices which say that how can uh, india talk about vasudev kutumbakam when it had such a lot of and still has so much caste discrimination mm. so this wider view of reality which i i sus, i imagine you are taking can you just elaborate that a little bit in what yeah. ways uh, yeah what is the role of this aspirational term and how do you how do you deal with the reality that it has uh, of how it does or doesn't actually play out on the ground mm. Well, I think one thing was, I mean, why why choosing that kind of Sanskrit age-old uh, concept was that 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 the rich uh, Indian tradition it should not be left to traditionalists or or let's say political Hinduism only, and this probably you know caused raised raised eyebrows in the left uh, of India that you know what are these people they they, they say they are socialists but then <laughs> then they cite Vedas. um but that, but we felt it's important thing to do and then at, at some point i was uh, googling what should have a kutumba come and then somehow our our site came before the rs rss site <laughs> so so i think we had succeeded on 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 you know diversifying the 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 use of of the of the indian or hindu tradition but then yes of course um i mean india india is very very troubled in many aspects and I, but i think it comes more than for for linking to gandhi ji that that already then in hyderabad and mumbai there was there was a clear critique of of gandhi from the dalit movements and then there's been more more you know from sort of anti racist uh, angles and feminist angles and so on so gandhi is not not in that way obvious uh, sort of foundation for for making this kind of inclusive intersectional politics today but at the same time we think thinking gandhi this this civilizational critique is so unique and and powerful that it it needs to be on on the map but the way we framed the gandhi related programs were like engagements with gandhi so not not um, you know having a saintly uh, rituals <laughs> or this hagiographic uh, events but then really look uh, critically and together what is it in in his his work and his thinking that uh, is still very relevant and in a way absolutely necessary today Yeah. Would you like to say a bit more about the uh, civilizational critique that Gandhi has articulated that in uh, that is and how you relate to it because and then I want to talk about your work on um, sustainable futures and uh, degrowth etc uh, but maybe if you could just articulate your understanding of the civilizational critique and really what was your civilizational critique today yeah um well so I, sort of in my early activism piece was was very central but i think mostly my focus and motivation has been on on ecological aspects that i somehow see that the the way things are going will 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 lead to an, on some kind of ecological collapse which makes life or good life very difficult for humans um in some some future and and though though during gandhi gandhi's time there was not um that kind of ecological discourse but the way he questioned technology questioned machines uh favored manual work then then i mean those are the fundamentals uh and and also when he when he questioned the the beneficial role of modern modern medicine and legal practice and so on um so 
so I, and I think this is what is <coughs> lacking in our environmental movement at the moment. That in the 80s it was very much you know cultural critique and uh, and you know civilizational critique where the ecological movement started, but now it has become sort of fine tuning of the of the capitalist modernity. And and I think it will not succeed because the the problems behind behind climate change or climate chaos and the and the biodiversity or ecosystems loss is um, I mean they're very deep rooted uh, and if we don't go go into the uh, fundamental drivers then then we are uh, at loss and there I think Gandhi Gandhi is very relevant today. Yeah. You've been very closely involved with the degrowth discourse in Europe and, and, and globally. Uh, in what ways do you see degrowth as a step towards or a kind of a mindset that would help move us toward a nonviolent economic system? Mm. Yes, I have. What is the connection the... between degrowth and economic nonviolence? Mm. Yeah, I think it's very, <clears throat> very clear um, that in the degrowth conferences, one can, one doesn't have to argue with the with the growthists <laughs> because that they're they you know we can meet and and discuss um, freely without you know needing to defend growth critique or or and with with the ability to imagine future where growth is not the the you know, main goal of the society. Um, and I think, well, I mean, for example, Kumarappa has, I think, features somehow not centrally, but at, at least there's some some note taken of, of him and the economy of permanence. You're referring to J.C. Kumarappa, right? Yes, yes, uh, the, the Gandhian uh, economist. And... Um, and you were then, mentioning economy of permanence. Yes, but then I think for the for the environmental movement, the, and especially the, for the sort of civil disobedience that now we are again surfacing in the ex extinction extinction rebellion, the Gandhi has played a very very direct role. That some uh, Nordic. Scandinavian friends of mine, they have sort of tracked how all the, this started in Europe. And it's the, the Norwegian eco philosophers and peace researchers, Johan Galtung and Arne Nes, that they actually came to India in 69 for the Gandhiji's, um, was it 10 hundred? Yes, centenary. Correct. Centenary. And um, and and they toured the ashrams and really got got deep into to, to the Kandian tradition on the site. And then when they came back, there was Norway was building hydropower like anything, like all rivers <laughs> were were to be dammed. So so they were part and they sort of organized these civil disobedience actions against um, this dam building. So early seventies, the first uh, so what what we can call eco satyagraha. Where we fought, and from in Norway, and then you know, Sweden, Finland, so many other European countries. Um, so these kind of li linkages, which are not not that clearly known, that our own movement history is not not that well organized. So so this is not like in Finland in I think seventy eight. There was this big eco satyagraha that sort of started the Green Party. Um, but it's not not that you know they thought you know, this is now a Gandhian struggle, but it was sort of just a response uh, inspired mainly from from maybe then the Nordic context. Mm. Does the Green Party in Finland have a position on non-violence or mm. violence and non-violence, or is it a ambiguous uh, situation? Um, well. In earlier, early in the Green Party, for well, in Germany, Finland, the peace uh, movements were very central. Um, that there was this movement that combined against the nuclear arms and nuclear power. That was, for example, in German Green Party, really a cornerstone. But um, 
but like it so often happens, the parties have become mainstream. The people who join them are not that much movement oriented. And and in Germany, there was a big change when Joschka Fischer was the foreign minister, and they then decided to send soldiers abroad. And so this kind of pacifist uh, fundaments were were turned upside down. In Finland, the Green Party is, is against NATO membership, which is sort of one one litmus test for 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 peace on or war. Because if Finland joined NATO, then we would be part of Turkey's Turkey's invasion of Syria or or American adventures anywhere. So for me, it's 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 clear no. But some voices are there that oh, it's you know some some alliance has to be there, <laughs> and all the other EU countries are there. Um, and also now, now what, what what we should see more is all countries joining this nuclear weapons ban treaty, which UN um, made and was ratified just last week or two weeks ago. Um, so there also we don't, you know, the Greens are not aggressively fighting for it because the, the hegemony in Finland is that we should keep NATO options open, and and if we join this treaty banning nuclear weapons then then that door closes because nato wants to have nuclear friendly countries nuclear weapons friendly countries in as their members mm. can you uh, what is your view on this recent uh, un move uh, marco uh, uh, do you feel that it's a very big step in curtailing the spread of nuclear weapons or will it be uh, ineffective? What is your assessment of this new well, UN resolution? It, it remains to be seen, but at least these kind of slogans that were made on 22nd January when it came into force that now nuclear weapons are illegal. I think it's an you know, important statement and an important fact that until now they were, you know, one, one weapon weapon among the many, and then there were agreements to curtail them. Um, but there was not, you know, real, real this kind of legal uh, prohibition. So, so there's a very strong argument now for for the country, countries to join and and put pressure on the nuclear powers. Mm, but it's well, it's a long way, but. But if we we'll think of it, then of course, you know, every every, every country should join it because uh, because you know they're weapons of mass destruction, not just for humans, but for so much of life in on on, the, on this planet. Um, that the humanity really stepped into new new age and new territory when the nuclear bomb was developed and 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 used. Um, so so if. So this kind of wisdom we really need to have to roll back knowledge and roll back technology that is is uh, destructive. That would be a very obvious thing to do. So it's at least it's a step in the right direction. Whether or not it will get us to the desired goal, that's a separate story. Mm, yeah. Now, uh, Marco, we are also living in a time when there is uh, a proliferation of. Uh, hate-based politics mm. you're seeing it in europe also right in yes. in germany we have seen we've seen reports of large marches where the neo-fascists are uh, you know confronting uh, those who oppose them those who are still who are opposed to fascism and in favor of democracy uh, how does this situation look to you from you know the background of your activism, and and do you see that nonviolence can be a way in which these forces of hatred and darkness can be addressed? Mm. How do yes, we? Yes, uh, mm. yeah, Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's a really re real and scary development, and actually, I mean, it's a fascistic uh, tendency that that we see in so many countries. Um, and first, it started with sort of protest of the of the marginalized, in a way, the people we have been also sympathetic with in this anti-globalization movement. So marginal farmers, rural populations, industrial workers, and so on. But now we see that this this extreme right party is quite popular among among upper classes as well. So so they 
they so the same kind of alliance that we saw in a way in Germany that the, the business business and the frustrated working class found each other in in the fascist uh, front and I think no, non-violence one, one thing is this idea of dialogue that that if we you know when we are against fascism then it will not take us very far if we just say that this is bad this is bad these people are you know on a wrong track but through through dialogue uh you know try to get a sense that what what drives this kind of xenophobic um extremist violent um leaning uh thinking and and then you know have faith in this kind of uh, this uh you know searching for the truth truth even with the with what looks looks like looks the uh, adversary so i think that's one clear clear lesson for for sort of uh, us yeah. with yeah. the progressive outlook that that we we need to enter into into a dialogue to get a sense and to 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 prevent this from from getting out of hand are there such groups across europe that are attempting to use uh, dialogue in this way and you know trying to reach out mm, uh, well i don't know I don't know systematically, but some friends like uh, Risto Isomaki, he has gone to to the rural, uh, this like farmers societies and forest owner societies, and try to discuss that 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 you know things are changing. That if you want to keep up, it, it, it it's not good just to say no to animal rights or just say no to to uh, you know leaving forests to grow and <clears throat> and so on. So he has got some good good response, um, but then on central level, then the lobby positions are, are still very very hard, and then then this um, xenophobic hate speech brings um, votes, brings popularity, um, and and then this. And I think, like in in twenties, it was it was there as a you know one one radical stream among, among the many. Um, but then, when when the economy went gone into went into crisis and the legitimacy of the political system was uh, eroding, then then it got this kind of upper hand. So I think we're now in twenties, <laughs> in, in, in literally and in the <clears throat> in the sort of where we are. That still things sort of run okay the economy is so fine Polit- political institutions still survive like they survived in the u.s but this storming of the capital reminded me of the burning of the reichstag that in germany the, sort of the last last uh, hit against you know that democratic institutions you know are finished <laughs> was was when the when the parliament building was was burned and then we were like okay what's the use of parliament <laughs> if the parties are messy and even the buildings burn mm. so yes we need really really a counterforce mm. today for the non-violent option yeah but Michael, how much of the opposition to non-violence is coming uh, from the far right and to what extent is there still perhaps bitter by uh, opposition from those who argue that uh, the violence of the oppressed is justified mm. and that who it is from that standpoint that gandhi then is accused of being almost a like a imperial imperialist collaborator because uh, that argument goes that uh, non violence just allows the uh, the hegemonic forces to continue to oppress people so yeah. to what extent in your context uh, mm. not just in finland because you are very well connected with a great deal of european activism is this argument still very much um, holding the ground I think I mean this basic out- outlook is so different that the Russian Revolution from 100 years back it was really inspirational and and a landmark for for the left movements around the world for for a very long time until end of the Cold War 
and then in some pockets like in Nepal or somewhere it continued during the 90s and 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 OOS as well but but when in Gandhiji's time it was it was really you know one of the good options in a way on the hand that we just have to organize a revolutionary army and then then things will change and 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 this kind of power 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 transformations can be done but now there's nothing like like that there's no 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 movement which is looking at the russian revolution as an inspirational example and organizing on that basis so so the violence um in the i mean but there's a lot of talk in europe about the islamic terrorism but if we look at the numbers it's it's not you know in europe it's hardly there that in 80s we had the left terrorism and then we had the catholic protestant violence in in the in ireland which which were sort of more lethal <laughs> so but in any out any, any case the sort of violent political action is is in all cases very marginal at the moment which is in a way i mean good that non-violence is the is the main mainstay and and but then then for it then to be to, to continue so so then the democratic institutions need to be there and including the you know, free press and and not not corrupted elections and so many other things which are challenged in all directions at the moment so um, in closing marco what what advice would you give to young people both on non violence as a political as a form of political action but also drawing upon your work on sustainable lifestyles mm. what are some of the uh, doable things that ordinary young people uh could do uh which would help move both society and economy towards uh mm. non violent systems mm. well i think one is this um, we should look at things really comprehensively because piecemeal that i mean the way we are now it's a, it's a it's a end result of a very comprehensive uh uh forces of of modernism modernization and, and and capitalism so so then we our response has to be equally equally comprehensive and there some things i really would like to see more is this non cooperation um that we because capitalism it's not such a fortress it's there because we all in a small small ways uh, keep it going so for example gandhi's call called for swadeshi on economic terms and then for people to quit their positions if if they were part of the oppressive system so these two basic <laughs> steps in non non cooperation um and self reliance are, are really really something that we need now now more and then i think this looking at things from the last person's angle um that for example this climate solutions there's so many you know false solutions we just change to electric cars and so on but then if you look at from the last person's angle you know who hardly use any motorized transport then then the options uh, or the responses look very different so with this kind of you know methodic uh, lessons from gandhi ji i would advise the the youth to to get um, into more 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 of a more action and more effective action beautiful would you like to before we close would you like to share anything about what is coming up in the near future within the vasudev kutumbakam network either in india or finland or and is it across europe or is it just in finland well it's lots of finland sweden here we have have people who really own the idea and can contribute to the network and well one is this world social forum we were quite quite involved in the virtual edition this uh, january 2021 as, as in, by the name of vasudev kutumbakam yes yeah, so, also also the 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 sort of slogan and brand was there so we carry on um on on i mean promoting the kind of 
ideas that plans and that we 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 worked during that week and then towards the new new forums and um and I think there's now appetite for this kind of alliance building coming together and also for this kind of comprehensive response because of course we have to critique we have to resist but if we don't have an idea also you know how we create the alternative then we don't get very far and there I think this uh, comprehensive democracy approach um, that we have worked on is is really something that that we are, we are we are happy to share and and bring bring people on board. Any other closing thoughts that I got that whatever is left for you that has not come up? Uh, no, it was really pleasure and a privilege to be part of this uh, thank you. conversation thank series. You, Marco. It's an honor to you know have you in as part of this series. Yes, and thank you so much for for keeping Ahimsa on the on the agenda. Mm-hmm.